thanks a lot. Thanks a lot in particular, the organizers of that event. And um, one of the lessons learned of the Corona and the pandemic is that um, uh, online conferences and online events are even more complicated, at least to organize, that they feel somehow live um, and uh, that we have an idea, uh, an opportunity to here to discuss. I'm a bit, I'm a bit excited, yeah, but maybe I have some fear because we have really a high ranking panel here speaking about those what make all those what we discuss in the other sessions and pillars possible and that's the money as the moderator already said and so we have um, five speakers today and the first speaker will be somebody who is very widely known as a friend of ukraine uh, i do not know if i know see the picture now professor georg milbrat used to be prime minister prime minister of saxony um, but uh, as I understand, it was his PhD that was already on public finance um, um, uh, uh, some, some times ago. And, um, but he's not in that position here. He is not, uh, he is from the, he's the special uh, counselor of the German government to the Ukrainian government with regard to decentralization. And from that, he started to do that from the scratch on. The second speaker will be Antony Levitas. Um, I was told he is one of the worldwide uh, best experts on public finance in general. And um, uh, uh, Mr. Levitas is international consultant and senior fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. And he did uh, political and analytical advice to a row of countries in the Southeast and the East Europe and um, we'll speak about personal income tax. The next one um, of our speakers is Vyaslav Nechoda. And um, I learned, Mr. Nechoda, that you are the father of decentralization in the Ukraine. But you are not only the father of decentralization, you are also Deputy Minister of Communities and Territories for the Development of Ukraine. And um, I, when I saw your CV, uh, that you are already involved in decentralization or in municipal issues since the 90s, um, please find me somebody who has more experience in that. Um, so uh, really, I'm, I, as I said, I'm a little bit afraid because of the uh, level of the speakers. Next speaker will be Alexander Slobosha. And Alexander Slobosan used to be the executive director of the Association of Ukrainian Cities. So he is one of the clients of the one who implement decentralization in the Ukraine. Um, and he will speak about um, the opportunities of uh, also the source of financing. And that source of financing is debt, there are debts yeah, and what has to be considered in that respect. And our last speaker is Mrs. Irina Ozimok. And she is program manager with the Western Niche Enterprise Fund. I'm sure she will explain what it's about, because if I would start here, I would do something what, whoops, uh, what um, I shouldn't do to use your time, uh, which is precious as finance maybe. And um, so I will um, go now for the sessions. But before, I want to make one technical um, remark. The remark is, please uh, hold, hold the timelines. So the speakers will have 10 minutes. We will make, go for a discussion later on for five minutes after each speaker. And then we will make a final round where each speaker has an opportunity also to make some uh, final statements for that session. Yeah. Then we are through with the presentation of the participants. I hope you agree. This is really a panel um, with high level experts from, um, from the international side, from the Ukrainian side and from the international finance side. So I would love to give the floor now uh, to Professor Georg Milbrat and he will speak about uh, the local, uh, the optimal design of uh, local finance. Well, thank you very much uh, for having invited me uh, to this panel. Uh, today I'm not talking about territorial reorganization uh, of future legislation 
uh, constitutional amendment uh, in Ukraine, but uh, uh, about money. Uh, money is always important, uh, and um, therefore I think it's uh, very useful uh, to uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, functioning democracy uh, together with uh, uh, resources, financial resources on the local level, but not only about uh, uh, sufficient resources that is uh, uh, evident, uh, but about uh, the structure uh, uh, of resources uh, that should be in line with the principle of self-government and subsidiarity. To find um, the appropriate structure and sources, we must look to the expenditure and uh, to the underlying local task. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. The main task uh, of local self-governments is uh, to provide uh, public goods and services to local uh, population. Redistribution and uh, macroeconomic stabilization should be primarily executed on the central level. So uh, you have to separate uh, these uh, two levels. And um, therefore, I think uh, uh, LSG, uh, local self-governments, uh, should be financed uh, to protect and improve local economy. That uh, means uh, that the resources should be relatively independent of central de decisions. They should be stable uh, uh, in, the uh, in the short run and in the long run, uh, 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 growth rate should be the same uh, as GDP. Sufficient it should be, and it should be all own fiscal resources. That means uh, in essence, own fees and taxes with a high degree of autonomy concerning uh, the fee or the tax rate. Uh, and um, the next uh, um, uh, thing we have to uh, 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 look at is that the structure of the local income sources should resemble the structure of local tasks and expenditure. Next slide, please. Uh, the most important principle concerning the, uh, uh, the uh, allocation of uh, financial resources is uh, for local uh, self-government uh, the benefit principle. Uh, as far as possible, um, the public goods and services provided by them uh, should be uh, financed by special charges, fees and contribution. Uh, that is uh, necessary uh, because on the local level, you have some sort of exchange. The uh, uh, municipality provides services and you pay for it, uh, especially the users benefiting of uh, local uh, public activities should pay or in, as the other, as the other side, originators generating costs for, public, uh, for the public, especially concerning environment. And... Um, that is uh, uh, the fee, uh, 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 the fee uh, uh, definition, and uh, uh, if it's not possible to finance it by fees, it should be local taxes. It should based on, uh, uh, be based on an extended or uh, collective benefit principle. That is, uh, it should uh, 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 compensate um, uh, uh, more general goods and services for local inhabitants, um, local producers or not for the individual use. This is uh, the difference. And therefore, we are talking about uh, taxes and the citizens and the municipalities are, uh, in a way, provider and customer of uh, local um, uh, goods and services. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, typical answer to this question, uh, what taxes is real estate taxes? This is a traditional and typical uh, way of to compensate municipal expenditures, uh, which are mm, uh, uh, costs for services for inhabitants and in some ways local private economic activities. Uh, you have it in, uh, in Ukraine, I will not talk uh, so much about it. Uh, uh, the tax uh, base could be uh, determined by the central government, but the rate should be uh, determined by, uh, the, uh, uh, by the municipality. Uh, if people want better uh, or more uh, services, then they have to pay for it. There is no free lunch, and uh, I think that must be uh, respected. Uh, 
we have uh, in some uh, in some uh, uh, countries local excise taxes based on the benefit principle. I don't see this at the moment in Ukraine. We have local taxes on business. You have it, but uh, to a, a small amount, uh, the unified uh, taxes. And uh, in some uh, uh, countries, local taxes on extraction of natural resources. If it's necessary, you can improve your system by introducing or um, uh, changing uh, uh, your tax system in this way. Next, please. Next slide, please. Uh, more important for Ukraine and for a lot of um, uh, uh, countries in, in the world, uh, uh, is the local share of important national taxes, especially the personal income tax. Uh, if you uh, give a personal income tax uh, to uh, the local uh, level, you should uh, uh, ask yourself for what reason uh, do you uh, give this share to the local level? And I think the main uh, argument is uh, that uh, the resident population gets um, services from you and therefore their, uh, their uh, share of the income tax should be uh, 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 go to the local level and especially to uh, the municipalities where the resident lives and where the social services and uh, public goods are um, uh, provided. Some activities of uh, local self-governments are uh, aiming at uh, uh, economic activities and businesses. If you have no business tax, I uh, explained it before, or the business tax is not enough, then you could uh, distribute uh, uh, the personal income tax share according uh, to uh, uh, the place of production. In the case of uh, uh, resident population, you uh, uh, look at the resident. Here you look at the place of production and uh, you can uh, 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 allocate the taxes according to the system. Distribution, like in Ukraine, uh, according to the place of registration makes no sense. If you, are, uh, you want to um, look for both cases, resident population and economic activity, uh, activities and businesses, and if you have no business tax, you can uh, get a mixed system. Part of the income tax is uh, distributed by domicile. Uh, the rest is uh, uh, distributed by uh, a place of uh, registration. Uh, the income tax has uh, some disadvantages, but I will not uh, go into details at the moment. Uh, second uh, uh, idea could be the corporate income tax, but I think that is not uh, 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 reasonable uh, because uh, the uh, 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 corporate income tax is uh, uh, unfairly distributed uh, among uh, places and uh, in, in the end uh, uh, among um, local self-governments if it would be uh, an income uh, um, uh, uh, means uh, to... Um, uh, uh, financial to in, uh, to uh, uh, ensure uh, financial or to transfer financial resources to the um, uh, to the local level and the fluctuation of the corporate income tax is uh, 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 very huge uh, so uh, it's uh, not the best uh, solution to uh, divide the corporate income tax between the central and the local level. In some uh, cases, uh, in some uh, countries, the value added tax is uh, um, uh, given partly to the local level, uh, but uh, this cannot be shared uh, according to the local tax income because of uh, the construction uh, of this tax. So the only way to uh, uh, distribute them is according um, to some uh, uh, Keys indicators, for instance, the numbers of employed persons or uh, the wage sum uh, uh, in the um, in uh, the uh, um, uh, the local on the local level. Uh, but uh, this sort of uh, uh, shared value added tax is uh, not, not much more uh, than a grant. Next, please. Uh, uh, therefore. Uh, 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 in the end, uh, you have to think about uh, a better distribution of the local income tax share uh, and especially uh, concerning the intermunicipal distribution. 
I have not talked about grants, uh, 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 un earmark grants or uh, unconditional grants. Of course, unconditional grants uh, must uh, are necessary, unavoidable, uh, but uh, you should uh, uh, con uh, uh, construct them in a way uh, that uh, uh, public uh, or the um, self-government uh, and, and the public authority is not uh, too much uh, uh, influenced uh, by uh, the central state. So that is uh, uh, my uh, uh, presentation. So in the end, uh, I uh, recommend uh, to talk more about uh, the distribution of your income tax share. Thank you very much, Professor Milbrat. Um, for that comprehensive let's say, tour through the opportunities of uh, local finance. And um, I had a look here for, and by the way, this is also information for our audience. You can make questions, yeah, and the, I will get those questions and then I will raise it. So far, I do not get one, um, but I have, I have my own one. And uh, this is a question uh, of delegated tasks. And uh, May to some extent the danger arises that the central state give more and more delegated tasks, but not more and more finance. Shouldn't be that connected the delegated task with the finance uh, for for the local self governance communities? Yes, of course. Uh, if uh, uh, you have to distinguish uh, uh, to separate uh, the f uh, uh, financing of. Uh, your own uh, local uh, self-government where you decide uh, uh, on the tasks and uh, delegated tasks. Delegated tasks uh, can be compensated by uh, grants of the federal government uh, or okay. in the, that is the case uh, in ah, okay. federal, federal states or in unitary states by the central government. If you get um, uh, if, if, you, if you get delegated tasks that means that you are working for the central government, and the central government should compensate you. So that is the ca case for uh, uh, grants and um, uh, to um, uh, respect some sort of autonomy, uh, the grants uh, should be uh, uh, given uh, on a, uh, 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 by uh, some indicators, not uh, 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 compensating of the exact uh, uh, costs of the community because uh, that uh, is uh, not very economic, uh, economically. Thank so, you. Uh, in thank, the end, thank you very uh, much. Uh, it means uh, uh, you have to uh, find uh, an adequate uh, grant system, but I have not talked about the grant system. I've talked about uh, yes, the uh, 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 tax system, the local tax system. Thanks a lot for your contribution. We will come back to you later, maybe with questions from the audience. But now we go for Anthony Levitas, uh, and he will take one of the aspects of Professor Milbrat's presentation, the personal income tax, and will make a comparison um, of the Ukrainian practice and legislative framework with European countries and beyond. Mr. Levitas, you have the floor. Thank you. Um... I'm having a little technical difficulty in that I'm hearing everything on a time lag. So I hope everybody can hear me clearly and I may take out my earphone at a certain point because hearing myself once is bad enough, hearing myself twice at the same time is enough to drive me crazy. But uh, please put up the, the slides. I'm gonna be talking about the personal income tax share in uh, in Ukraine, and I'm going to make two fundamental points. The first point is simply, uh, both of which say that the pit is the fundamental uh, financial foundation of local government finance in Ukraine, and for two specific legal reasons, at the moment that foundation is quite weak. Next slide, please. So personal income tax can be shared with local governments in two basic ways. The first is as a grant. And then what happens is the national government says 20, 30 percent of the national yield of PIT is reserved for local governments and then is distributed back to them by formula, most often by on a per capita basis. 
This grant is usually freely disposable, but it can be earmarked. That's not the way Pitt is shared with local governments in Ukraine. It is the foundation of the Czech financial system, for instance. Much more common, Pitt is shared with local governments as a shared tax and is returned to local governments on the basis of its origin. And the key thing is, what is its origin? How do we define its origin? Uh, Pitt sharing in this way is the largest source of local government revenue in much of Europe. The origin of the tax, as Professor Milbrat alluded to, is almost always defined as the local government in which taxpayers live. Um, in almost all of Europe, pit shares are defined as uh, freely disposable revenue, meaning local governments receive the money, they can spend it any way they like. And typically such pit sharing uh, is accompanied by an equalization system that guarantees poorer jurisdictions some percentage of the average national per capita yield of PIT, 80 to 90 percent, typically. Next slide. Hello, next slide. Um, as in much of Europe, pit shares constitute the largest single source of local government revenue in Ukraine. At the moment, it's 40% of SOS budget, cities of oblast significance, and 30% of Kramada budgets in 218 without social transfers, which means the money that goes through local government budgets for individuals, households, and utility payments. As in much of Europe, Ukraine has an equalization system that gives grants to local governments whose pitch shares are below the national per capita average. But Ukraine at the moment is the only country in Europe that defines the origin of pit as the local government in which the employer is legally registered. And Ukraine is also exceptional in that the pit is not clearly defined in the law as a freely disposable revenue. I'm going to talk about both of those last two points now. Next slide. Uh, throughout Europe, the origin of pit is defined as the local government in which a taxpayer resides and votes. The only current exception to this rule is Romania, where it is defined as the place of employment. That was once similar in Germany and briefly in Poland, but no longer. By defining the jurisdiction, the origin of Pitt as the jurisdiction in which a taxpayer lives, what happens is we align political jurisdictions with fiscal jurisdiction. This ensures that citizens know that they're voting for local government officials who control their taxes, not somebody else's taxes. And it's critical for ensuring local government interest in the behavior of their elect elected officials and increasing local government accountability to those citizens. It also ensures that the pit shares flow to the local governments in which people actually live and which are necessary to fund the services they need. Next slide. Um, excuse me. In Ukraine, the origin of pit is defined as the local government in which a firm is legally registered and not as often people think where people work. This breaks the link between tax paying and voting and undermines local government accountability. It also overfunds large cities where firms tend to be legally re registered at the expense of the smaller local governments in which many of their employees live and or work. The classic example in Ukraine is the railroad system. All the pit revenues flow to Kiev. There are other companies, telecommunications companies, insurance companies that are not registering their employees by where they work. 
Instead, all the money is going to the central jurisdiction in which the company is headquartered. What this does is weakens the efficiency of the equalization system. It overfunds the large cities, underfunds the jurisdictions in which people actually live or work, and requires, in turn, greater equalization grants to the poorer jurisdiction. Next slide. So what should be done? In the immediate, all firms should be legally required to register the pitch shares of their employees with the tax administration in accordance with where those employees work. So we should move from registration based on the legal headquarters of firms to registration based on where employees work. This won't ensure that political and ju fiscal jurisdictions are perfectly aligned, but it will improve the situation. It will also reduce the overfunding of big cities and increase the efficiency of the equalization system. But over the next few years, Ukraine should move the origin of pit to a tax player's place of residence like the rest of Europe, or perhaps consider splitting the revenue between place of work and place of residence. But what really needs to happen quickly is ending place of uh, registration by the legal headquarters of employers. Next slide. The other big problem with legal problem concerning the pitch share in Ukraine is that it is not careful, clearly defined um, as a freely disposable revenue. Almost everywhere in Europe where PIT is shared on an origin basis with local governments, it is defined as a freely disposable local government revenue. Sometimes it is defined as a local government own revenue, as is the case in Poland, for example. But this is technically a mistake because local governments are not politically responsible for setting the rate of the tax. As Professor Milbrat mentioned you can allow local government impose surcharges on the pit tax in which case they do have some rate control but at the moment we're talking about a shared tax which is not an own revenue but needs to be defined as a freely disposable revenue this is not the case in the ukraine neither the budget code nor the new draft local government law define it as a disposable revenue what they do say however is on the expenditure side, local governments are supposed to finance both their delegated and own functions with their pitch shares. Next slide, please. Both, also, both laws also say that with respect to delegated functions, local governments act on behalf of the state and that the state can override their decisions if it feels that local governments are not fulfilling their responsibilities. So uh, with respect to Hromada, for instance, mayors are defined as the state executive authorities with respect to delegated functions. Uh, what this means is that if the state thinks that the local government is not spending enough money on its delegated functions, it has, in theory, the right to come in and say, spend some of your pitch share on these delegated functions. Both laws also define many, many functions as delegated functions, even though local governments don't get grants for them. The most important of these is preschool education. The local governments do not get a grant for preschool education, but it is considered a delegated function. And theoretically, the state could come in and say, you're not spending enough on preschool education, spend more and spend it out of your pit shares. As a result, there is a real problem between local governments acting as agents of the national government with the national government being able to direct them in their use of their largest single revenue, 
and local governments having the choice to spend freely disposable revenues as they see fit. Next slide, please. Whether the national government will actually come in and direct local governments to use the pit shares on particular delegated functions is, of course, an open, function, open question. My guess is that it, this probably won't happen with large cities. I'm a little less sure about it with respect to Cromada. But the legal uncertainty surrounding what kind of pit revenue the pit share is, is deeply problematic. Why? Well, first, without the pit share, only 15 to 20 percent of local government revenue is freely disposable. This means that they have choice with only 20 percent of their revenues. And in theory, they are agents of the national government for 80 percent of everything else they do, for 80 percent, the other 80 percent of everything else they do. If the pit share is not freely disposable, and the national government has the right to direct its use, then local governments have independent control over very little of their budgets. Again, less than 20%. This undermines local government planning and renders long-term investment extremely difficult. More importantly, in going forward with Swabajan's presentation next, if the pit share is not clearly defined as a freely disposable revenue, anybody who wants to lend to local governments cannot be sure that local governments will have sufficient revenues to pay back their loans because at any point, in theory again, the national government can come in and direct the payment of uh, the, the use of the personal income tax for other purposes than the payment, the repayment of debt. Next. Could you come to an end now? Yes. Hmm. That was the end. So what should be done? Well, the budget code and the law on self-government should be clearly define the pit share as a freely disposable local government revenue. Uh, the framework legislation should reassign some of the functions that have been delegated to local governments as delegated functions should be redefined as own functions. Uh, this is the most important one from a fiscal point of view is preschool education, which is a very significant part, piece of local government spending and which, as we said before, is not supported, unlike uh, the other education functions by a earmark grant. And finally, a category of shared functions should be introduced into both laws in recognition of the fact that many of the services that local governments provide are simultaneously both national and local. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and I'm sorry if the, the the sound was off, but I couldn't hear myself twice. No, the sound was not as awful. Your timing was near at the edge. Fortunately, we do not get questions in. And so I would like to give the floor to our next speaker, uh, who can may also react already on the recommendation and suggestions made by uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. By the both experts before. So, Mr. Nechoda, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I would like to greet everyone, dear participants of the international expert discussion. Greetings to you all, and I would also like to welcome and greet our guests who have made wonderful presentations so far. Mr. Georg Milbrat, with whom we recently keep meeting more often at similar discussions as well as, well as Mr. Anthony Levitas for his rather um, professional presentation. And I would also like to underscore that the topic of this conference, which is dedicated to the development of communities at this point, is extremely important. It's essential for Ukraine as well as relevant. You know that we have had local elections on the basis of the new territorial lineup set up, and this time it's absolutely different from 
what we had at the beginning of the year 2014 when the decentralization reform was just rolled out. I would also like to see the slides presented on the screen for me to provide my comments. I would also like to stress, although today we will be speaking more about finance, money, going to local communities, but this money is necessary, first of all, for the development of these communities. Just as we said at the time when decentralization was being unfolded, this money has to be effectively used only in the capable communities. The resources, of course, that we are talking about today and responsibility for their own Ramadas has to be taken on by all of these communities. So let me remind you about the prerequisites which have changed the system of authority at local level, which have changed the mandates and thus resources were changed and modified because just a few months ago the situation was slightly different in places. So if you look at this informational sheet, you will see that we already have the foundation for newly created territorial hromadas and of course at sub-regional level, which enables us to complete the decentralization reform effectively and to provide also for the effective organization of the local administrative state administrations, local state administrations. Um, we also have to stress that from the time of Ukrainian independence, territorial division in Ukraine hasn't changed until now. Out of more than 11,000 territorial communities, now we have 1,469 communities. So we have reduced the number of those communities by more than seven times. And uh, now we have 136 rayons. These are the figures that may be a, a bit surprising. And with this new territorial division, we can already ensure that subsidiarity principle is anchored. And the prevalent majority of powers and the majority of resources can be provided to the local level in order to resolve all of the local matters. The principle that was previously impossible when the old system was in place and another important result of the reform was the financial basis of new Hromadas, which is now secured for them, so that Hromadas can exercise all of their newly assigned functions and powers. All of 1,469 Hromadas in the city of Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, um, received the possibility to have direct interbudgetary relations with the state budget. So now they are not in the subordination of local regional administrations. This will come into effect, though, on the 1st of January, the year 2021. The next slide tells us about the state support of gramadas and territorial communities in order to incentivize and hold the decentralization reform itself. That was a very important point in history for us when we wanted local communities to amalgamate out of their own will voluntarily. Decentralization, which was initiated under the slogan of voluntary amalgamation, became an additional motivation for the territorial communities to continue enlarging and amalgamating. So, how finance impacted on that was the subventions paid for territorial communities and channeled in order to support uh, the local infrastructure in the uh, village communities. Talking about the state support allocated to amalgamated communities in line with the budget that we are hoping to receive for the year 21, 2021, given the problems that we have not only in Ukraine but worldwide. 
we are faced with the problem of uh, shaping local budgets for the next year. And we see that some challenges are already in place. But I hope that with joint efforts, we will carry out the tasks that territorial communities are faced with, because they are the ones to face these challenges, especially with regard to pandemic at the moment. I'm not going to talk about all of the amounts of money envisaged to support local developments by the State Fund of Regional Development, the money envisaged for the elaboration of Romada spatial development plans, also subventions for the development of um, administrative service centers. It's a very important resource because out of these newly created 1,469 Romadas, more than 700 Romadas still do not have their own administrative centers for service provision. And in line with the newly approved law, all of the newly created Romadas have to have such centers of service provision. We also have money allocated towards the development of an improvement of sports infrastructure, in particular school spaces. Subvention for social and economic development is really arguable. Perhaps my colleague Alexander Slabajan will elaborate and expand on that more in terms of resource allocation, but there are different attitudes with regard to that. Another amount of money budgeted is the internet improvement in rural areas. Once again, establishment of cultural centers. Something else that we are, cons are concerned with in Ukraine, it's the road construction, reconstruction, repair and maintenance of road infrastructure. So the local and regional authorities have to find the balance of interests in order to develop road infrastructure to make sure that the access to the services is provided at a higher and better level. Now let's talk about a few key current tasks that the newly created Hromadas are faced with after the local elections in the context of local finances. It's necessary to underscore that about half of the newly established Romadas or municipalities do not have the experience of work with the new budget resources and powers and they nearly have to start this work from scratch. They don't have previous experience and they now shift into the new conditions of work. And what's happening at this stage after the elections is the formation of executive bodies, therefore involvement of um, skilled personnel to work in these new bodies or councils. Um, this task may seem to be simple, but on the other hand, it's really complicated because, once again, the majority of the newly created Romadas are in the rural areas, and there we definitely lack qualified staff. Recruitment of qualified staff is a big and painful issue for us. Next problem is finalizing demarcation and transfer of facilities operated by local councils and and state administrations to the ownership of Hramadas, because a lot of them still belong to the state budget. And uh, the transition or the transfer of these facilities will definitely affect the local budgets. Next, it's the performance of the audit of budget expenditures. Um, the Hramadas of municipalities have to also run the inventory checks of Hramada property, as well as the resources to look for opportunities of revenue increase. And lastly, the result of all of these efforts will be drafting budgets for the year 2021 and adopting these budgets. Hopefully, they will be adopted in time. And we hope that you lead with Europe because of their qualified regional experts will definitely provide consultations to the local newly created Romadas because associations of cities and towns of Ukraine are already doing that. Next steps in decentralization reform. 
We have to understand what's going to happen next in Ukraine, because the question of money is directly connected with functions, authorities, the mandates, which now have been reassigned to newly created gromadas. And as Mr. Milbrad said at the very beginning, he's very well aware of that, that in Ukraine, in order to complete decentralization reform, we need to introduce changes to the Ukrainian constitution and to bring it in uh, compliance with the European Charter. And for that, we also have to introduce legislative improvements that is to do with the distribution of powers between executive bodies and local self-government in line with the new territorial setup. They need to understand clearly which powers right now belong to them. Because once again, resources that the state will have to guarantee to them and the local authorities will have to ensure that local taxation, local levies and collections in terms of money will run exactly according to the newly uh, created territorial setup. For us, it's very important that the rules of game don't change. And this will be in place when the full package of financial documents ha has been approved. And another task we are faced with is the improvement of the system of horizontal fiscal equalization to reduce inequality in financial support of Hromadas. Given the new system of Hromadas or municipalities, we are still going to face difficulties in 2021. But based on that, we still have to develop a more steadfast and therefore fairer system. We are talking about shaping and forming budgets, taxation, collecting levies and duties, so that local communities, Romadas, become self-sufficient. And once again, that there is this fiscal equalization, which is done in a fair way. And on the other hand, it's important not to lose um, different stimulus for uh, various local budgets because different romadas are at different levels of development. And of course, improvement in allocation of the personal income tax to the local budget, taking into account place of employment and residence of taxpayers, as Anthony Levitas has just been talking about it. We are working on it and we hope for the support in the Parliament of Ukraine as well as the support of our partners. It's a political rather more political issue because from the technical standpoint it's feasible but on the other hand we need to understand that the change of the system that we have in place right now in the nearest prospect may result in imbalances for the shaping of local budgets therefore such decisions have to be taken in advance for the local level to be prepared in advance but this is a very painful issue because a lot of local communities are suffering because taxes are paid unequally and some are winning, others are losing because the taxes are paid given the place of employment and residence of their taxpayers. So at this point I would like to bring my presentation to a close and say that of course, there should be questions at the end, and of course, we will have more opportunities to discuss them in delay, in detail, to speak about the financial issues in order to support the implementation of the reform. Because we know that if we have the due ample resources, if we have certain opportunities delegated to authorities as their authorities, delegated to uh, local communities as their authorities. This will definitely be decisive factors in ensuring their stability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nahoda. Um, you use a little bit too much time, so we do not have time for questions, and, but there is a question. Nevertheless, the question goes more in the direction of Mr. Levitas. We will do that at the end uh, round. Uh, that, that we use our time now for the sequence of speakers, and I, I'm, um, I have the pleasure to give the floor to uh, Alexander Slovosha. Dobrogodnia, 
Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I will concentrate my attention in my presentation on problems and prospects of the market of local borrowings. The previous presenters have already spoken at length and in detail about the system which is evident in Ukraine and provided their recommendations that can be applicable for Ukraine now. However, I am still basing my opinion on the principle that money is never sufficient, it's never enough. And municipalities can argue that both in Ukraine and in Germany, as well as in any other countries in the European Union. The first slide, please. What is the point? This year, Ukraine and local self-governments are faced with huge problems pertinent to the fact that de facto there has been re extra burdening of local levels with new powers and authorities and at the same time some financial resources have been taken away from them. Let me give you a few examples. For instance, when we talk about paying for the land, some of the entities of commercial activities have been pro are deprived of that. Uh, especially during the time of pandemic, this is d uh, damaging them. For this year and next year, small businesses have been exempt from paying single uh, tax. There has been an intrusion into the rent of communal utility properties. And there are a lot of other things of similar type where in terms of budgeting for the state functions, central authorities begin to deprive local uh, authorities of resources. And some have seen huge problems of, um, in that, and then be, they begin to shout outcry. But we decided to take a look at that from another perspective. And we saw we don't know if the local fuel excise duty will remain with the local level, level if uh, um, the state railway will have to pay some of the taxes for the usage of land to local hromadas. Different resources have to be sourced and we have analyzed to see how local towns and cities exercise their borrowings. The so-called long and short cheap borrowings, the portfolios brought to us by external and internal creditors. I would like you to focus your attention on this slide because the year 2021 for local budgets is going to be very difficult and local borrowings mechanism will have to be honed, improved and they will have to work more with the internal, national creditors. You can see that in Ukraine alone, the number of borrowings over this year is at the level of 23, including 22 city council borrowings. And the total borrowings amounted to 5.8 8 billion Ukrainian grievances, including city council borrowings, and the majority of them were uh, state banks, three public banks, one commercial bank, one international financial institution. They are the creditors. Let us see another slide. It demonstrates the share of these borrowings, and you will see that the most active in this respect are large cities. We see Dnipro, Kharkiv, Lviv, Zaporizhia. 88% of the overall scope of borrowings, of the total borrowings, uh, falls to 4 million strong cities. And interestingly, this year, these million strong cities were joined by regional players such as Mykolaiv, Ivano-Frankivsk, and my uh, town of origin is Mail, also Kamenitsky, Ismail, Melitopol. These are some small towns. 
that have already mastered these mechanisms and they have been able to borrow extra budgeting in these crisis conditions in order to finance their infrastructure. And most importantly, these are borrowings to implement the projects of the so-called expanded recovery. Or, that means that all of this money will definitely have to be recouped. But in the future, it will result in extra resources for the borrowers. In, on the next slide, you may see the distribution between the groups of creditors. We can see in terms of the terms of approval of such borrowings. It took sometimes very lengthy periods to approve such borrowings. Not all towns or cities were able to obtain these borrowings. But at the same time, you see that some of the borrowings are more attractive. And if you look at interest rates, internal borrowings um, were delivered at 12% interest rate, and external borrowings were provided at a 3% interest rate. But the major problems that we were able to single out and identify you may see that only 1% of the newly established municipalities within this year have taken advantage of this instrument, which is so widely exploited all over the world and in Europe in particular. So the first problem is the problem of mistrust, lack of trust. Local budgets trust deposits more rather than the instruments of local borrowings, or bonds, Another point is uh, these are organizational capabilities. We have calculated that a small number of municipalities of that 1% have specially trained staff to run borrowings. And running local borrowings, it's an, an essence of how municipality will be able to exercise and practice some of the instruments of midterm financial planning. So the horizon of planning for the local self-government for us in our case in Ukraine is just one year, that's all. Next, municipalities do not provide any financial planning. This is to do with the lack of trust in um, central executive authorities because they keep changing various financial and taxation legislation. It's also to do with the lack of trained staff. And this also is to do with some of the projects being very long lasting, a lack of strategy, strategic documents are not there. With you lead, we have been working very effectively to develop a strategy for municipalities, which we were just willing to become more capable as communities on the basis of the towns of regional significance or with small populations. That is to say, we need to create capable personnel for institutions at the level of local governments in order to plan effectively and run and control local borrowings and debts. Next, it's the procedures of bureaucratic character. The midterm of agreeing or approving a borrowing was about 50 days, although the Ministry of Finance can sometimes consider such borrowings between 50 to 120 days. So we have the Institute of Silent Agreement. We have already copied it from de facto from some European countries, but uh, in fact, it's not operational. These are some political factors especially when we have to approve such borrowings, especially on the eve of uh, local elections. Many of such borrowings were blocked, put on hold for whatever political reasons, and we would like to offer uh, the changes and introduce electronic registers for such borrowings and make sure that every international financial institution can see the capabilities and capacities of every community and see indicators of their economic development, how insolvent 
is each of or solvent, how solvent is each of the local communities with a horizon of planning from three to five years. This is a really extremely necessary for the implementation of large scale projects and to make sure that our local communities are capable. And this will be the answer to the question whether our communities will become cap capable. In five years, we will be able to see how municipalities will have functioned because now we are used to the fact that in order to get a fish, they bring it to you, but you do not learn how to use a fishing rod or fishing line. And you, they need to be demonstrated how to work with the instruments of local borrowings. They need to be relegated to a league of large cities. The cities with the populations of million strong, like the associations of cities. In associations of cities, we quite often use uh, different brainstorms, and we have chambers of large cities, uh, middle-sized cities, and small rural communities. And in each of these chambers, people come, the representatives come, and they exchange and swap their experiences, and they draw on local experiences. Next, it's the opportunity to involve the so-called internal creditors, investors in the person of uh, individuals, physical individuals, and opening the market for that for municipalities, reducing the cost, all of these operational things. The Ministry of Finance usually charges 2%, imagine 2% of the scope of the total amount of borrowings, but de facto, they do not exercise any support activity. This can also be outsourced. All local authorities should look for the opportunities to find the financial support and somehow other um, organizations could contribute their revenue to the local budget for providing such services. So electronic registers is something that's definitely needed. It's a reduction in terms of approving borrowings and the replacement of many potentially corrupt procedures of approving such borrowings, uh, reducing the number of contacts with different officials. It's the revision of interest rates. It's the reconsideration of the margin charged by the Ministry of Finance that only earns and benefits. So what can municipalities do? Municipalities, first of all, have to introduce structures at their own levels and prepare uh, local experts to be able to work with such financial toolkits, um, develop strategies and begin to introduce mid-term financial planning as part of these strategies in order to attract new resources, conduct training sessions for all of their personnel. And now we are at the point of introducing such training sessions for all of the deputies in the local councils, councils. And most importantly, we also need to run constant monitoring of the availability of the creditors that are potentially able to provide such borrowings. The budget code does not require any changes to be to amend this document. Now, every territorial community can exercise such borrowings. And the next stage that we envisage with the help of our international partners is introducing such businesses to Ukraine that will be ready to provide such uh, borrowing mechanisms to local Ukrainian municipalities. That's all from me, and I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you. Yes, you're ready to take the questions, but you use already the time for all the questions. We will do that at the end, uh, at the end round uh, when, when we uh, when we have some time for questions, which are taken, which I already take there. But I want to give the floor last but not least um, to our colleague from the Western Niche uh, Enterprise Fund. If I'm if I'm right, Mrs. Osimok, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm very happy to be in this highly esteemed company. And I'm very happy that a lot of the issues that I have in my presentation echo with what has already been presented. Our audiences of listeners will be able to 
will be exposed to a great picture of finances and the responsibility at the local level. So my presentation, if I may. I would like to speak about how much an efficient and effective city costs today. Today we have heard about numerous sources of financing, but as it was pointed out by the majority of speakers, it's never enough for local budgets. And for us to understand why it's always insufficient, first we have to check two more aspects in addition to money, which is always insufficient. We need to see if money is exercised, is used efficiently and effectively, and if the priorities are correct, because the litmus paper test in Ukraine is the achievements at the local level, that is to say the roads, but we also have to finalize and implement different projects that will stimulate local economic development and the local budgets because of that will be filled and then the local budgets will be able to invest in other important projects effectively. An interesting example and challenge in this respect was the pandemic that hit us this year because all of the towns and cities were confronted with the lack of budgeting resources, especially uh, with regard to tackling the effects of uh, the pandemic. But my experience of interaction with the Ukrainian mayors testify to the fact that there is a nice example of the town of Voznesensk in the east of Ukraine. It did not require any additional budgeting. It did not need to seek any other sources to fight the pandemic because throughout many years they have been investing consistently into this sector of healthcare. So we must remember that the money at the local levels may be midterm and there are long-term resources and negotiations about such sources can last for years for which, together with Alexander Slobajan, we have met at different events recently and talked about it together. So strategy and the vision is, are the things very important in this respect. We have spoken about the sources of financing, which are essential, but there are also alternative sources of financing to change uh, the city. It's the Church for Investments. We'll talk about it in greater detail. Um, involving credit funds. Alexander has spoken about that international banking institutions and co-financing with businesses, including private-public partnerships. And it's time in Ukraine to launch this mechanism, as well as grants. Grants as an element of at least a start to incentivize uh, some of the project's implementation. So what we, do we need to do to address to attract investments? Quite often we hear this question as a foundation because we used to be an investment foundation and now we support more of social projects, but we are mindful of the fact that Ukraine is a country which over the last years has been speaking a lot about investments. Every time the president changes or the mayor changes, we always look for investments. So what does it actually need? It's necessary for us to make sure that you have a reliable partner at the local level and the local authorities have to be open to investments. Everybody has to ensure transparent rules of game at the level of state and the city. Therefore, the responsibility of local self-government needs to be shared with the responsibility at the central executive level in order to ensure the investments, because a lot of such decisions are taken at the central level. And I will immediately jump to the last point, which is courts. A lot of investors say that they want to feel that their interests in Ukraine are protected, that they are in on an equal with uh, domestic players. And here, a lot of necessary reforms that are moving very weakly and slowly have to be expedited. Now, I would like to speak about one case. You know that quite recently, the head company, the producer of mountain equipment, they inter entered Ukraine and Vinitsa won competitive competition with some of the other cities in Ukraine. But something that the investor was faced with was that when all of the terms and conditions were agreed and when they began to talk about communications, the payment for electricity bills was so expensive that the investor 
was greatly surprised by th by that, was shocked by that, I would say, and an expected surprise. So when we speak about a competent team, we speak about a team of people who will be able to provide all of the necessary insights to the potential investor, talking about the details and uh, things to do with the communication so that it doesn't go into a frustration or huge losses uh, for the investor and therefore prevent this investment from coming to Ukraine. Competitive advantages. Cities and towns compete in Ukraine and they compete with foreign towns and cities. So if we were able to attract this Czech manufacturer to come to Ukraine, other towns can do the same. But it's important to remember that in the world we are also competing for talents. Manufacturers, plants and manufacturing facilities, they always go where they want to find human capital. Human capital and human resources, it's the resources that will be able to move these projects on. And the mayor of Khmelnytsky knows now that it's much easier for people to go out of his city rather than look for jobs with the small salary. And it's a big, big challenge for many small towns because when we talk about investments, we need to have a strategy or the vision of the development of a town or the whole region for the nearest future in order to create educational or training centers, professional, technical educational centers to make sure that we have truly competent personnel that will generate, let's say, financial resources for the local communities inclusive. Another important thing is the business climate. And here I would like to give an American example. Big, huge, giant companies now are vying for some of the uh, HQs, not in the central cities like San Francisco or New York. But when Amazon was looking for such a place, they selected a small town just because the region itself ranked first according to conducting business in that country. And it's really essential and critical to remember from informational sources. We need to make sure that the situation is objective because a lot of reporters report and cover the situation in one way, but on the governmental portals, they report the improvement as while the media, they report about deterioration. So the news coverage has also to be objective. Another important point, the ambassadors of Ukrainian communities when at looking for and attracting new investors have to be existent investors. So when a town or a city promises that we will provide for all of the necessary terms and conditions, but the existent um, investor says, no, it's hard for me because there are a lot of challenges I'm faced with. There are no guarantees in place. Then basically, it works against the local communities and does not raise their attractiveness. And that's a real bottleneck. So existing investors, internal investors that Alexander spoke about, must become potential ambassadors for local communities. I'm talking here about regions, towns, cities, rural communities, because the regional policy plays an important role now. We understand that you cannot overcome obstacles without those that will help you. A manufacturing facility can be built sometimes in the territory of two amalgamated communities, and these amalgamated communities definitely have to collaborate. There is another interesting producer, Sherp. They uh, manufacture interesting innovative machinery that allow us to fight the consequences of uh, natural disasters and their management, its management was looking for another place to create a production facility and they hoped that Ukrainian towns and cities would provide them with the profitable lucrative offers. Unfortunately, no such offers ensued. So if there are some interesting innovative projects that come to Ukraine, we did definitely need to make sure that they stay here in Ukraine. Alexander has already alluded to credit lines available in Ukraine. And at this point, I would like to say that smaller scale projects that enjoy 
they may enjoy one type of uh, financial resources. Other larger scale projects like uh, transportation, renovation, when we talk about water supply, renovation, all of these are long term and very expensive projects. And it's unrealistic to find and source finances for such projects. But for illustrations, I would like here to give the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development the option created for them. They already created their own program to the amount of 567 million euros for Green City 2 program. And Alexander also spoke about that, that small towns are already be becoming active players, Melnitsky, Krivirich. But here, when we speak about the responsibility at the local level, it's important to communicate about that with local communities because the dwellers of such communities are afraid of such huge amounts, 13 million euros, like in Mariupol, that were able to obtain this line of uh, credit for their transportation. And Mikolaev was able to find 5 million euros in order to re renovate their water supply system. And the case about Warsaw, about 87 million euros for the renovation of public transport services, about underground line in particular. This information was sent to me by someone from the World Bank, and they said to me, why don't Ukrainian cities uh, join this program? We understand that this is an expensive opportunity, and it's a long-term opportunity, and such project is not going to be finalized within the term of one mayor. But a local community has to be aware of such opportunities, and therefore I think then local administrations will not be afraid of taking such sometimes maybe not very popular decisions. We talk about smaller scale projects, but still no less important. We fail to remember sometimes businesses, but businesses is not only taxpayer, there are also an they capacitate us to um, pull off the various projects. I have only taken very few examples, business and city planning, for instance. There are a lot of works that are necessary on an ongoing basis. A lot of maintenance work has to be done. But still, if special agreements are in place, perhaps with time, less expenditure will go into maintenance and repair. So this is up to collaboration between local authorities and businesses, because sometimes there are strategic facilities like parks, which are the calling cards and litmus pa paper tests for a lot of towns and local communities to see whether the qualitative changes have taken place. The pandemic has also demonstrated that, that Ukrainian businesses in various towns and cities joined their efforts in order to help to furnish and equip various clinics and hospitals. At the same time, they awaited support from the central executive authorities. But small and medium-sized enterprises, especially, they were hopeful of receiving financial support from the authorities so that they could continue surviving and generating the necessary taxes for their local towns and cities. Business and social issues. I am addressing you today from the west of Ukraine, from Lviv. Yes, I understand this just one minute and I will be done. Social enterprises can also resolve the issues that towns and cities have to deal with. And we also have a social bakery in Lviv that makes various pastry. But at the same time, they have set up a center of rehabilitation of women after various uh, life circumstances and local authorities work with that. They provided their budgeting and social issues are being resolved and therefore social services are being supported and the projects of developmental character are also very important that we know that in a lot of Ukrainian towns and cities we have the so-called participatory budgets where towns and cities know which areas um, they can involve businesses for co-budgeting such projects. There are also grants available, and I'm sure that towns and cities already know about a lot of international organizations that work with grants, issue grants. But as Alexander also pointed out, we need to prepare professionals 
not only on domestic borrowings, as Alexander mentioned that, but also generally what is grants, what is investment, cities and towns have to present themselves in a very competitive way to potential uh, investors. Thank you and sorry for taking more time. Thank you, Mrs. Ozimak. You, you did the same like the most others did. Um, uh, obviously, I've uh, I, I experienced now that um, the Ukrainian participants have so much to say that they need also uh, more time to say. That's not an uh, issue and I uh, think that's highly welcomed. We already have one question which goes in the direction to our first two speakers and maybe the third speaker. So, Mr. Levitas, Mr. Milbrat and uh, Mr. Nechoda. And that's, um, the question is, um, uh, is made um, uh, with regard to um, uh, the uh, personal income tax uh, and the question if the uh, place of the employees, not the employers, but the employees registration should be deciding or the place of work and which system would fit better for Ukraine. So, um, if you can give me a sign. So, Mr. Levitas gave me the sign and could make some remark as well as Mr. Milbrat afterwards. And then we will check if Mr. Nechoda will join as well. Mr. Levitas. So, the first thing to say is that um, there's only one country in Europe that I know of that does it by place of employment, and that's Romania. So the general consensus is that it should be by place of residence. That said, um, we have a problem in Ukraine with the, the propiska and people not being registered where they actually live, um, which creates additional problems for doing it it by place of residence. Um, and it's possible to have a system that is split between place of residence and place of work. The problem is, and this refers back to Professor uh, Minister Nagoda's comment, um, we don't know now how much it is actually being returned to where people work and how much PIT is being returned to companies who have offices uh, where people are not working, but their employees are spread out across the country. So as I said, the first thing to do would be to figure out where PIT is by place of employment um, and to legally require firms to register and allocate taxes back to the tax offices in the jurisdictions in which their employees uh, work. The next thing to do would be to think about uh, having local governments. I mean, there's an opportunity in the crisis, which is to say that if the rule was that um, it is allocated to local governments on the basis of where employees live, where people live, then local governments will very quickly go out and try and make sure that all their residents are registered correctly. This is what happened in Poland and in a number of other places, and it's actually a big stimulus for good local governance because the mayors actually go out and they say to people, look, we need you to register because we want to use your, be sure we get your taxes so that we can improve your roads and your school. So the act of uh, dealing with the problem of the propiska could be a huge opportunity to increase the alignment of uh, political and fiscal jurisdictions and the identification of local residents with their local government. But as I said, the first thing is employed by place of employment. The next thing would be to think about moving to place of residence. Thanks so much, Mr. Levitas. Mr. Uh, Professor Gebilbrad, you want to add something? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, if um, 
you want to have a, a personal income tax which goes uh, to the res uh, which uh, is uh, distributed to the uh, community where people live, then you need registration that is asset and uh, you, uh, first of all, uh, the Bayes must then uh, be able uh, to have uh, legal means to re-register the, person, uh, the persons who live in their community, then it will work. Second uh, element or second uh, argument is uh, in the Ukrainian uh, uh, setup, uh, there is no compensation for businesses. And therefore, I would uh, 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 um, suggest to think about a, a split system because uh, uh, the uh, community must be compensated for costs uh, and efforts they do for, uh, for local business. Otherwise, uh, only those uh, municipalities have advantages where people live, but the, uh, the uh, uh, municipalities where people work. And we are interested in both things. So either you have to uh, find a way to compensate uh, the cost for businesses, but other ways, then you can have a, a, a pit uh, only based on um, uh, the uh, basis of uh, where people live. Otherwise, you should uh, uh, look at a more uh, complicated and mixed system. The current system registration is totally nonsense. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Milbert. We do not have any um, uh, registered questions from the, the audience. So I would like to ask you to give you us a one or two um, sentence statement, what you take away from this session. Yeah? And I will start uh, because I, I saw a little bit this uh, common sense on the issues in the Ukraine and also on the, on the, on the general structure of uh, the finance in, uh, in the uh, in the, the, between all uh, of the members. And I think uh, one thing what was um, uh, clarified a lot by Mrs. Ozimak is also it depends on the balance. Yeah? You need also central services um, uh, combined with local services, which uh, goes together to enable the business to create wealth in the regions. Um, if I would go now through the sequence of because, all right, I go by the, by the sequence of speakers here on my screen. Mr. Nehoda, what is your takeaway um, uh, from this session? Could you make that in two sentences? Thank you very much indeed. I would like to make the following conclusion, that in Ukraine, we are in a very favorable situation in order to continue improving the system of local finances because under this old system it was impossible. Things that have to do with PIT and other things can only be implemented starting with the year 2021 or even 2022. I think these are very solid propositions that we will definitely get on board and I'm really appreciative of this discussion for this professional discussion. Thank you so much, Mr. Nehora. Mr. Slobohan, uh, can I ask you for that two sentences? What's your takeaway from this session? Most importantly, it is trust, dialogue. If the rules of game keeps changing for the local self-government, and then no gains of any reform will be operational or functional in favor of the local communities. And another emphasis I would like to place is that the local communities have to be aware of the fact that they enter the age of global competition and the state will not give them any finance. So they have to base their activities on the resources, financial terms, and any other infrastructural resources available with them, and they shouldn't be afraid to go and compete with others. Thank you so much. So I would like to give the floor for Mrs. Ozimak. What is your takeaway from this session? 
When we talk about Ukraine, everyone usually says it's strange that the country is so rich and strangely we always run out of money for various project implementation. As we have seen it today, there are different sources of financing and implementation, different urban projects and rural projects. We have to be able to prioritize in a correct, proper way, especially in the eyes of external and internal investors, international financial institutions. We have to present ourselves as a reliable partner that those institutions will be ready to uh, give these borrowings to with a lot of trust. Thank you, Thank you so much. So, Mr. Levitas, two sentences. What is your takeaway? Yeah, I, I guess I, I'll pick up on Swabajan's comments and say that I agree that it is uh, important, critically important to uh, stabilize the rules of the game. Um, and I also think that this is the moment where key pieces of the rules of the game uh, need to be clarified and uh, put into law in ways that are clear and transparent and the origin of PIT and the nature of PIT as a local government revenue, I see as two of the most fundamental uh, rules of the game that are still in flux and uh, potentially will cause problems down the line with borrowing with local government autonomy and with the whole the stability of the division of, of finances and competencies. So that's where I chose to put my evidence, uh, my, my emphasis and uh, I really am grateful to this panel because I think it, it, these issues have been raised in a clear way. Thank you. So we, we close the circle now by a short statement of Professor Milbrat um, on his takeaways from today's session. Uncertainty is an enemy uh, of uh, uh, long-term decisions and an enemy of investment. Therefore, uh, uh, Romadas needs stability and if the uh, central state uh, is responsible for macroeconomic stability, he has the duty to stabilize uh, the financial uh, endowment of uh, uh, municipalities. I think that's the best way uh, for uh, economic development, especially in the uh, case of the crisis of the pandemic. Uh, the uh, state should uh, shelter uh, the uh, uh, romadas uh, concerning uh, external influences like the pandemic and not the other way around. Thank you so much, Professor Milbrat, and I would like to give my thanks to all of the panelists and usually in a real conference now the applause would start by the audience. You have to think about that for yourself. Um, um, because I know even TV shows where you always have some single spots of applauding people in that. It was a pleasure to moderate you. Yeah, okay, we applaud ourselves. That's the right thing. And, um, it was a pleasure to moderate you. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm still afraid somehow. Maybe it was not because of the session. I, okay, I will look for the next uh, meeting, what I do have now. Thanks a lot. See you soon. And... Stay with you lead and stay healthy and keep distance.